Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Novec talk. Um, thank you for being here. Sorry for a couple of minutes um, delay while we set up the Facebook live transmission. Um, let's start. Yeah, so welcome to another series of, of uh, Novec talks. I will remind the ground rules in a moment. Um, but first, I want to um, tell you about today's agenda. As always, we will follow the same format. I will give a short introduction um, to the whole thing. Then we will have a video by one of our early career researchers. Uh, this time, it, it will be Sarah Sakagni from the University of Copenhagen speaking about promoting social distancing in the pandemic beyond the good intentions. Then we will have for 45 minutes our main talk for today, and then um, a few uh, questions and answers at the end. So as always, um, I want to remind you that this is organized by our center at the University of Pennsylvania, the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics, and as always, I have um, just two slides about one of the things we do at the center. Um, this time, it's about our training programs. We do social norms training programs. As you can see, we have done this in many parts of the world over the last few years. Um, they are tailor-made, and um, most of them are to measure and change social norms as the central topic for, for um, different um, policy and, and company objectives. We focus on several things, including measurement, change, social networks, uh, adoption, abandonment. Um, our teachers, most of them are affiliated to the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences at Penn. And uh, we have a Coursera, which is free as well, and which is now close to reaching 100,000 participants. So um, to come back to our Novec series, um, this is our updated um, list of speakers and dates. Uh, you can find it on the website as well. Um, and then a few ground rules, which are the same as, as always. Please keep yourself muted. Um, if you can, if you want, please keep your camera on so that we have a more interactive experience. Um, if you want, please change your name, um, your username rather, to reflect your name and affiliation. And then for questions, uh, we have a co-author here, as in previous occasions, that will be answering um, questions in the chat. And then at the end, you can use the raise hand function and, and ask questions also. Uh, we also have a moderator. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, we're transmitting live on Facebook, and then the recording of the talk, as always, will be uploaded to our website a few days after. So, yeah, let's go with uh, today's early career researcher. As I mentioned, um, today it's Sarah Sakagni from the University of Copenhagen. She researches topics in behavioral economics. And the talk is called Promoting Social Distancing in the Pandemic Beyond the Good Intentions. So let me share the video. Good morning, um, I'm Sara Zaccagni, postdoc at the Department of Economics at the University of Copenhagen. And today I'm presenting a joint work with Paolo Falco, assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen uh, as well. So the title of our paper is Promoting Social Distancing in a Pandemic Beyond the Good Intentions. The motivation underlying this paper is that uh, during the pandemic, we have been exposed from many different sources to the recommendation of staying home as much as possible. Uh, so in this paper, we test the effect of these kind of reminders on social distancing, and in particular on both intentions and actions. Um, and uh, also we try to investigate which are the most effective reminders in doing that. So we know from the literature that pro-social behavior plays a role 
uh, in determining compliance with that recommendation, but who are the relevant others? So we conduct a pre-register randomized control trial with a large representative sample of Danish population. Uh, we expose different groups to different variation of uh, a recommendation to stay home as much as possible. Uh, we did it um, at the peak of the first pandemic wave in Denmark, so between the end of March and beginning of April 2020. So all the subjects in our sample received a first email with the treatment and a questionnaire. So we tested four alternative ways of framing the recommendation, uh, which differ according to the emotional proximity of, treat of treated subjects to those who will bear the consequences of their behavior. Uh, so um, we emphasize the risk for you or for your family or for others or for the country as a whole. In addition, we have a group receiving a generic reminder without any framing and a group, a control group receiving no reminders at all. So our final sample is a balanced panel of 5,310 respondents and attrition was balanced across the different treatments. So this is how the reminder was displayed in the email uh, the participants received. Um, this is just one of the variations, but it states, if you go outside and become infected and you might get very serious respiratory problems, stay home as much as possible. Um, so let's describe uh, the outcomes that we use. First of all, we uh, measured the intention to stay home, uh, asking people, asking participants uh, whether they intend to stay home tomorrow in the first email that they received. Uh, and then after uh, two days, we send them another email um, asking them to report their um, actions the day, uh, the day before. So whether they stayed home yesterday. Um, so even if our uh, actions measure is self-reported again, then we, uh, we try to see whether uh, there was correspondence with this um, mobility measure that used mobile phone data, and uh, we found some like uh, similar path. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about the results. We have three main results. The first one, uh, I would say, is more descriptive results, but it, um, it's very interesting because it showed us 12% of respondents in our sample declared that they intend to stay home, but 42% of them do not follow their intentions. So we uh, actually report uh, and confirm the well-known uh, intention to action gap um, already, um, already documented in the literature. The second uh, result, which is uh, our main result, is the effect of the reminders on people's intentions and actions. So in this figure, you can uh, see the effect of the four different framings of the reminders. So uh, starting from the one that emphasizes the risk for you, going to the one that emphasizes the risk for the country as a whole. Uh, the red bar represents the intentions, while the orange one represents the actions. So as you can see, we find a, a significant increase in the number of people who stayed home um, if uh, the reminder emphasizes the risk for you or for your family, but the effect is there only on the red bars. That means only on the intentions. When we look at the orange bars, the effect is not significant, uh, any, it's not there anymore. Um, so again, uh, the, the main finding is that the most effective reminders are those who emphasize the risk uh, for you and your loved ones, uh, but again, uh, the effect is there only for intentions and not for actions. Uh, we do not find anything for uh, others and for the country as a whole, uh, neither on intentions nor on actions. So very little evidence of prosocial behavior from, uh, from our, uh, our findings. The third result that I would say is the positive note of our paper is that uh, the uh, effect on actions is there if we look uh, at a specific subgroup of the population, which is uh, those who are already in bad health conditions. So if I have to sum up, I would say that we conduct this uh, RCT in Denmark to test the effect of reminders to stay home at the beginning of the COVID crisis. And we find that reminders significantly increase people's intentions to comply, but only if they're framed with respect to the consequences for the, subjects, uh, for the subject itself and his family. We do not find significant impact on behavior, uh, but we find a significant impact on behavior specifically for people facing greater health risks. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I would be happy to um, 
I left here some point of discussion. I would be happy to discuss further. So uh, don't hesitate to reach me or me or Paolo if you if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Great. So thank you so much to Sarah for uh, her presentation. I know that she's here in the audience. So if you have any questions for her, feel free to write them in the chat and hopefully she will be um, answering all those questions. If you want to know more about Sarah and her research, you can go to her website displayed here or um, just scan this, this QR code. Um, just one second. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It has been uh, great to to have it and if you have questions you can you can ask me in the chat or uh, write me an email thank you great thank you so much sarah yes that was very interesting um great and just a little uh, reminder that if you'd like to be featured in one of these videos of early career researchers um, in the next talk please send us your video before sunday april the 18th as you probably already know, we are accepting applications on a rolling basis, but um, if you'd like to be featured in the next one, please submit before that day. Um, right, and our next talk, a small uh, reminder, will be on the 22nd April. Professor Simon Gefter from the University of Nottingham, he will be speaking about the behavioral logic of rule following and social norm compliance. Uh, same day, same time, same uh, link and registration. So please join us for that as well. And with that, um, I would like to introduce our main speaker for today. Uh, Professor Katie Milkman um, is the James G. Dinan Professor at the Wharton School here at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the co-founder and co-director of the Behavior Change for Good Initiative. Uh, she's a host of um, a very popular behavioral economics podcast called Choiceology, and she is the former president of the International Society for Judgment and Decision Making. Um, she has worked or advised um, a lot of organizations um, in topics around behavioral change, including Google, the U.S. Department of, of Defense, the American Red Cross, Walmart, and many others. And she writes frequently on these topics for the Washington Post, the New York Times, USA Today, and um, other outlets. Um, her book is um, will be launched this Sunday, May the 4th. Um, it's called How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. Um, and our moderator for today will be, um, as in some of our previous occasions, Dr. Oigon Demand. Uh, who is a core member of our center and is uh, an associate professor of practice in behavioral and decision sciences um, here at UPenn as well. Um, we also have uh, Professor Milksman uh, collaborator Erika Kyrgios um, in the audience, and she will be uh, answering some of your questions in the chat, as mentioned. So with that, I give the floor to Professor Milkman. Thank you, and thanks for the lovely introduction. What a great um, opening presentation. I'm excited to share some of my work with this group. And I should, um, I should note that I have a hard stop at two. So for everybody who may get 15 minutes of their, their day back, <laughs> um, I'm really excited though to spend the next 40 minutes with you chatting about this. And I'll try to wrap up by 10 of so we have some time for Q&A. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about a mega study approach to applied behavioral science. And I, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time, you'll, you'll see me fly by a couple of slides. Apologies in advance for that. Um, first thing I want to say, and I think will be familiar to everyone in this group, is that we increasingly, as behavioral scientists, are uh, influencing policy, which is exciting. There's been a giant increase in the number of nudge units from zero, roughly 15 years ago when I got into the field, to um, hundreds as of today, which is really exciting, but also comes with a bit of a burden. Um, and that is explicitly, or to be specific, the burden is that we need to provide really sound policy advice. And ideally it should be based on field experiments. 
But there are some challenges with that. Um, one is that running field experiments requires really large fixed costs and is slow. Uh, another is that even when we have field studies to look at, it often is hard to compare apples to apples. Normally we're comparing a sample in Denmark with a sample in California and, and we are trying to make comparisons, but they're really different groups that weren't randomly assigned to conditions and that creates problems. And then finally, um, I also just want to also highlight that the replication crisis that is really more focused, I think, on um, laboratory experiments in general, but it can affect us too, because it's not always clear which behavioral insights are going to be robust. And if somebody ran something but didn't publish it, then we might spend a lot of time trying to replicate another failure without knowing it. So what's the solution? Well, what I want to argue is one solution, not the only solution, but one solution can be what I call mega studies. A mega study is a very large field experiment in which lots of smaller sub experiments are all being run synchronously with the same dependent variable. So thus mega, so a study with many, many, many arms, um, lots of studies in parallel all embedded inside of it. Um, and there's a bunch of benefits of doing applied behavioral science following this model. One is it allows for comparability of results across studies so you can make those apples to apples comparisons. Another is that the fixed costs can be borne by just one central organizer, which can lower the marginal costs for individual scientists. It also reduces the risk of learning nothing useful, right? Like we're always taking a risk when we run a study with a single hypothesis because it may not pan out. And it's useful to know it doesn't pan out, don't get me wrong, but it's even more useful to hand over a policy tool that can change behavior for good. Um, so we have less risk of, of that kind of result. And also we can eliminate the file drawer problem because we'll publish the negative results along with the positive uh, in a sort of meta-analysis across the studies. It can be run as a tournament with interdisciplinary teams. So the usual challenges of cross-pollination where the economists want to publish in the QJE and the psychologists and psych science and the management scholars and academy management journal, um, that's fine. They can all submit studies and run studies in parallel, but at least they're going to cross-pollinate by seeing what hypotheses one another test. And then they can publish their individual papers in their own preferred journals. Uh, it also is, I think, really exciting to think about the way we could do some machine learning and behavioral phenotyping, meaning trying to figure out what works best for whom with a really wide set of treatments tested in a single population. So I think that's an exciting area. We actually haven't done much with that yet, but, but there's work in progress. Um, and finally, it can really accelerate the pace of scientific discovery relative to the way we usually do things, which is sort of like, you know, plotting along one study every few years, getting published in an area um, by a single team. You now we can sort of really accelerate that. Um, this is not like a totally brand new idea by any stretch of the imagination. There's a lot of similar models for doing science out there. One that I think is particularly relevant is the common task framework, which revolutionized AI about a decade ago. Um, and in this common task framework, what will happen is all of the researchers who are working on a given type of problem, say, um, you know, image recognition, will work with the same exact problem task. So they'll all get the same set of images to try to run their algorithm on. They'll use the same validation method. And uh, it'll be really transparent what hypotheses are tested and results. And it's easy to make apples to apples comparisons there. And we try to do that a little bit in the social sciences when we, for instance, all use the same games like the ultimatum game or the dictator game in studies, but we don't have true comparison. It's fair. It's not a level playing field in that, you know, if you run your subjects at Caltech and I run mine at uh, University of Pennsylvania, we at a different point in time, we know there's going to be differences. So there's still a bit of mess in that. Um, another area where I think there's a lot of parallels is just the scientific tournaments have been out there for a long time. And they're similar in flavor and the spirit of trying to sort of figure out what works best, but they don't involve random assignments. So that's a big difference with this approach. So today what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to talk about a model mega study that uh, is a paper that actually is just conditionally accepted at Nature, which is like possibly the biggest thrill of my life, because I am such a nerd. Uh, so really excited about that. And I'll tell you about this model study. But then at the uh, very end, um, I'm going to give you a preview of some work that's literally in progress, um, work on vaccines that we've done. So hopefully I'll have time for that. Okay, so this mega study with 24 hour fitness, I just want to start with sort of why we started here. This is one of the first mega studies we ran. And, and when I say we, I'm talking about a giant team of collaborators. Erica Kyrgios is one who's here in the audience and is going to take questions in chat. But um, 
This work is being done by the Behavior Change for Good initiative that I co-direct with Angela Duckworth here at Penn. And there were 30 scientists involved in this first project, plus the staff of the center. Um, so why, why physical activity? Why start here? One reason is actually that only half of Americans exercise enough. And exercise is basically the closest thing we found to the fountain of youth. It's just magical. It's good for all sorts of disease and depression. It's, it's wonderful. And in fact, 9% of premature global mortality is due to insufficient physical activity. So it actually is more important than I think a lot of us appreciate Though you might say, well, the people who need uh, physical activity may not be members of 24 hour fitness gyms. They may not be the ones who are, are like most at risk for an adequate physical activity, but even gym members don't go to the gym nearly as much as they intend to. You'll see that in a minute. Um, but I think really even more motivating for this particular study topic is that we can measure this high frequency decision objectively. So it's a really nice playground for thinking about things like habit formation and behavior change um, that's durable and, and repeated. Okay, so um, what reliably increases exercise? So there is past research out here and I just wanna give a nod. I'm, I'm giving a too short nod, but big rewards for repeated gym visits over four weeks have been shown to create lasting habits. Um, and even planning reminders and small rewards for four weeks in a project that I worked on with John Bashir, who I know is a later speaker in this seminar series. We had an intervention that lasted for four weeks and we saw durable change um, that lasted for 40 weeks thereafter, where all we did was we prompted people to make plans for when they'd exercise, sent them reminders at those times and offered them small rewards on the order of magnitude of um, a couple of dollars. And that, that created durable change for 40 weeks thereafter. Okay, so what did we test in our mega study? We wanted to advance science beyond these insights. And so we had 30 scientists who designed 20 different individually pre-registered studies with 53 different experimental treatments and a placebo control holdout group. And um, we basically gave the scientists involved a playground where we said, look, you can vary what happens when people sign up. I'll show you what the sign up screen looked like. You can give them incentives. Uh, you can offer them reminders and send them interactive texts and weekly emails for 28 days. And if I told you all 53 treatments designed, your heads would explode and we'd be, you know, use up all our time. But I will just mention, we had sort of a one simple treatment that we put in there that was, we think of as our best practice based on past research, which involved planning reminders. And in this case, micro incentives, because, um, you know, we, we decided it would be prohibitively expensive and also not cost effective in terms of what kinds of treatment effects actually are effective or meaningful for policy to give larger incentives. So we incentivize people with about 20 cents per gym visit here. And then all sorts of different ideas were tested from framing to different kinds of incentive schemes to commitment devices. Uh, and I'll get through, I'll, I'll talk about some of the best performers in a bit. Okay, the methods. We recruited people for about 10 months. It's harder than we expected it to be, I will say. Uh, all 24 hour fitness members are about 4 million of them at this time. We're encouraged to sign up for a program designed by scientists to create durable exercise habits. And we ended up with 63,000 people roughly in our study who were skewed a little bit female, um, pretty far, like a lot of overrepresentation of California, which is where they have a big footprint. And we're on average only visiting the gym about once a month. So not super physically active people, even though again, probably not the very bottom of the distribution in the world. Um, Okay, so this is what it looked like when someone came and registered for our study. We had hired a professional graphics designer to try to make it look like a real professional program. It's the same person who designed ClassPass, all of their screens, if you're familiar with that, and invited people to sign up for the Step Up program designed by scientists. They consent to participate, give us their email, their phone number. We validate that we can send them texts, and then we randomly assign them to conditions. And uh, this is what I'm showing you the, what the condition the planning prompts conditions sort of most basic baseline condition we designed was people I should say in the placebo holdout control condition got a screen that just said welcome they were told immediately that they'd earn rewards equivalent to what we expected people to accumulate in other conditions on average and then they didn't hear from us again so we basically wanted to hold that sort of gift exchange component constant but otherwise the placebo control had no content. Okay, so this is what repeated rewards look like. You're told welcome, you've earned 100 points for registering, you can get 300 points for every workout, here's the conversion rate to Amazon cash. Um, then we have them schedule the dates and times of workouts. We'd send them text reminders uh, 30 minutes before those. And then most scientists, if they had insights they wanted to test about how they could 
enrich um, this program, a lot of content gets added here in the middle. Uh, so like, you know, maybe a video or a survey or some instructions. Um, and then finally, people are told, congratulations, you're all set. And then for the next 28 days, they get reminders, again, um, telling them, and the reminders could be tailored. If there was a treatment idea that the scientist was trying to reinforce, the reminder could, could be designed for that condition, but it was the same reminder every time. And then text reinforcement through interactive texts, and um, finally reinforcement via email. So I'm, I'm showing you an example. One of the studies was trying to figure out if encouraging people to select fun activities to do at the gym would get them to exercise more. And so an example of like the kind of reinforcement that might use is you'd maybe get a text message in the middle of the week asking if you had actually tried an exercise you enjoyed when you were last at the gym. If you said yes, they say great. If they say no, they remind you that's, you know, we're encouraging you to do that. And similarly, the emails you get with your weekly workout schedule that you had planned at the beginning will reinforce the message of a treatment condition often. Okay. So let me tell you about some of the results um, that we detected. And the first thing I wanna show you is our baseline holdout control and what that looked like over time because we do have pre-intervention exercise data. And you can see, I don't know if I'd call that a placebo effect. <laughs> I'd say there's no placebo effect over time unless there's you know some sort of time trend that we can't uh, see. But it looks like maybe right before people sign up, they're at a period where they're a little bit more motivated to go to the gym and maybe that's why they sign up. So you see that little increase before and then it sort of declines and looks pretty flat. So this is what the holdout control group looks like. And everything else I'll show you from here on out is going to be relative to this. So um, how much did a given treatment improve on the number of weekly gym visits relative to this baseline where people are going um, about, you know, one and a half times a week. Okay, so this is a very big graph with a lot on it, and I'm sorry, I, this is like the worst graph imaginable in some ways. I don't want you to read all of the things on the y-axis because it'll make your brain spin. What I really want you to see is the distribution here. So the x-axis is showing you, uh, well, sorry, every dot is a treatment effect from a giant regression where the placebo group, the holdout control is the omitted comparison group. So we're, I'm plotting treatment effect estimates for um, weekly exercise, um, number of weekly gym visits that are uh, boosted by a given treatment. So relative to placebo holdout control, then if you look at this planning reminders of micro incentives to exercise, you can see it increases gym visits about um, 0.15 extra visits per week. Uh, okay, and, and those are whiskers are depicting plus or minus one standard error to error. So not 95% confidence intervals, which can be confusing. Um, the placebo control was worse than most treatments, uh, directionally was worse than all but one. So that's good. Like behavioral scientists were able to do things that actually increased exercise over nothing for the most part, pretty reliably. 45% of the treatments we designed, um, as a team significantly outperformed the placebo control. And well, I'm not going to say a lot about multiple comparison, except that, um, this basically everything that everything I'm saying survives multiple comparison comparisons, corrections, uh, and you would expect, right, like 2.5% of these things to be significant, but 45% are. So you can see in aggregate, this is working quite well. Um, it's harder, a lot harder for scientists to beat the sort of best practice, planning reminders and micro incentives, although that treatment effect only increased exercise by 9%, uh, actually by about 9%, only 9% of treatments outperformed this significantly. So again, two and a half percent would be expected to by chance. A few do quite significantly, but it's, it's a lot harder. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit about how different things did. I'm starting with this best practice. This was not a huge winner to give people a prompt to make a plan to get, give them rewards, um, micro incentives. So these were 21 cents a gym visit and remind them this didn't do a lot for their exercise. It's statistically significant because we're really well powered, but it's a really small effect as you can see. And it also seems to decrease over time. Okay. But we did find some things that worked quite a lot better than that. And everything I'm going to highlight outperformed the planning reminders and uh, micro incentives conditions significantly as well. So this is one of the more interesting ones. Um, this was designed by John Bashirs, uh, who I, I know again is coming in a couple of weeks and um, Angela and Dina and I teamed up on this to, to design it. The idea here was to try to keep people from what we call falling off the wagon. So if you miss a gym visit, we give you a tiny little increase in your incentive if you come back the next time you have a scheduled visit so that you won't hopefully miss two in a row. So it's only 
nine cents extra. You normally get 21 cents for going to the gym. If you miss your Tuesday workout where you would have gotten 21 cents and you had a Wednesday one scheduled coming on Wednesday means you'd get a whole 30 cents instead of the usual 21. So we don't think, you know, people, there's no reason people should be strategically skipping Tuesday to get that extra nine cents on Wednesday. Um, but it's really more of a psychological intervention to emphasize that we want you to come back after a missed workout and see if we can get you not to fall off the wagon. Now I should note, if you miss Wednesday, then you go back to 21 cents for Thursday. It's a one opportunity only to get back on the wagon with that extra incentive. But this had the effect of increasing gym visits by 27 cent, uh, 27% during the program. So this was our best performer. And this is what it looked like. It looks a little bit like it's trailing off, but I'll show you more data in a second that will make you not think that anymore. Okay, um, our second best treatment is really boring. It was actually a control condition for something else. And it's just, we paid about an order of magnitude more in incentives. So incentives work when we paid people a dollar to almost $2, I should say, for um, making it to the gym at the time of a scheduled workout. They visited the gym 25% more than when we paid them 20 cents. Although I should note, it's not as big of an effect as you might expect. And it's neat to see that our top performer was not this use really low powered incentives. So this is what that looks like um, over time, the before, the difference between the before and placebo control and, and during the intervention placebo control is pretty flat. Okay, another one that I really was excited to see perform so well was a study designed by Bob Cialdini, um, also involving uh, one of my PhD students, Anish Rai, and this study looked at the power of uh, reinforcing a rising social norm, meaning telling people that everyone is exercising and it's going up, the numbers are increasing. And this was, you know, based on real data sliced in a strategic way, but it's true. And this increased gym visits by 24%. And you can see that one actually looks like maybe it was building a bit of momentum. Okay, um, this is another study design that performed really well. It was exactly the same as the first one I mentioned, just with very slightly different levels of incentives. So sort of like a nice replication. We tried a couple different incentive levels for that falling off the wagon design. And this one also worked beautifully. Um, and this one doesn't look like it's declining. So I think probably this is sort of a flat trend overall. Okay, last thing I'll highlight that was a big winner was giving people a choice between having each reward they would earn framed as a gain or a loss. So some people, um, you know, people could say like, I want you to tell me I'm earning money or I'm losing money when I don't come. And that increased gym attendance significantly as well. Okay, so just five treatments all worked quite well, which I think is exciting and promising in terms of thinking about the kinds of uh, rewards we might, might want to design the kinds of behavioral science that can be effective in this context. But I want to talk a little bit about next prediction accuracy, because that paints a slightly less rosy picture. So uh, we wanted to know if people could predict ex ante what worked. And so we recruited participants to try to predict which of these treatments would rise to the top. Because of course, if you can predict, you don't really need mega studies. You just sort of can run a tournament, get ideas, and then launch the things that people vote on and predict will be the best. And then you don't waste time and money on the things that people think won't be successful. So we had three studies, one with prolific workers, one with professors from um, the top 50 schools of public health as rated by US News, and one with practitioners in behavioral science. And then we looked at how well they could predict treatment effects. And I'm gonna show you three graphs, one for each group, the x-axis is the actual treatment effect that we estimated for a given study arm. The y-axis is the predicted treatment effect. Um, two things to note about this graph. There's a very small correlation, marginally significant. So this group was actually the best at prediction. I'll show you the others in a minute. But the maybe more interesting thing is you may notice that I've scaled the axes differently. So you can see the graph. They were an order of magnitude off in their optimism. So where we got a treatment effect of 0.2, they're expecting a treatment effect of two gym visits a week. And we're instead getting a fifth of an extra gym visit a week. So they understand the direction of the effects a little bit, but the order, they're just wildly over optimistic about how well this will all work, which I think is interesting. Okay, moving to public health professors. Now we have, if anything, a negative correlation. So absolutely no predictive accuracy and still wildly over optimistic, although ever so slightly less so. And finally, behavioral science practitioners, the least overly optimistic, though still very overly optimistic, and, and if anything, a pretty negative correlation. So no ability to predict at all. Um, 
this is a graph of what I showed you before. And the red things are what I showed you before. Those are the estimated treatment effects. So another way of displaying the same information. But now I've plotted the predicted treatment effects pooled um, and weighted equally across those three samples in green. So you can just see like zero correlation when you pull the three samples and wildly overconfident and op optimistic in terms of um, effect size they're expecting to see. So uh, I, anyway, we were, we were startled and I think it's, it's important to note how hard it is to actually predict what will work when everything sounds plausible. Um, scientists also got a chance to predict how well their hypotheses would do and uh, had no idea. <laughs> so that's all this graph shows you. <laughs> okay, so um, I have two more things I wanna share and then I wanna tell you really briefly about our flu shot study. So I'm gonna kind of race through this last bit here. Hey, was, if I just may to uh, interrupt yeah. So there was an interesting question um, in the audience, given the topic of the series, obviously. Um, somebody asked if you could develop uh, the social norms intervention a bit, especially, I guess, the Chill D one with, uh, with increasing social norms. Uh, who was the reference group and the way you sliced it? Did you give any information regarding who are, you know, the people in this increasing uh, you know, gym visits. Um, yeah, yeah, let's see. If, I think the easiest thing to do is actually go back and, and show you. So we said this is data from um, 2016 showing trends among surveyed Americans. And then it was telling them about the percentage of Americans exercising at least three times per week. And that was what we had, you know, we had to like slice it to get an actual increase. And that was the group where we found one. So that's what we focused on. Uh, and then we reinforced this through text messages and so on and sort of pop quizzes. Like, do you remember how many are exercising a week and the control there's anyway. So that's, that's how we did it. Uh, so you left it vague on purpose in a way people could then decide whether or not this information is sort of relevant to them. Right. So there's some, some vagueness built in. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. Okay, I'm gonna very briefly reference our results post-intervention because I think the main thing to say about them, well, there's two things to say about them. One is um, when you, we look in aggregate, this is just plotting the average gym visits during the intervention across treatments um, compared with the post-intervention gym visits. And remember it's random assignment to treatments. So you would expect a flat line, no correlation if there's not any durability of effects. But if a treatment effect induced during can, sticks around uh, until after you'd expect a correlation, we see a pretty strong correlation. So it does seem like when we do instrumental variables analysis, maybe every gym visit we induce, we probably see something like a 25% to a 30% um, return on that in terms of exercise produced in the four weeks after the intervention. So that's an aggregate where we're really well powered across all 53 conditions. We see that durability and that's order of magnitude similar to what past studies have shown, even though our incentives were much smaller. Um, but Individually, only 8% of the programs significantly increase gym visits after the intervention period. And what's going on there is just um, a power issue. We didn't increase gym visits that dramatically during the intervention. And what we're seeing is a pretty linear mapping, like how many extra visits we get. We're, you know, our best performer increased gym attendance 30%. You always see a roughly 80% decline in how much people are going to the gym after an intervention period in a study like this. And so now we have very little power to detect an individual study having an impact. So we were over optimistic too about how big of an effect we'd see during the treatment period, which would have allowed us to detect an effect afterwards. Um, but it, it clearly shows that it's harder to create this durable change than we might hope. Okay, so um, key takeaways from this study about 45% of our treatments significantly boosted exercise by 9 to 27% at low marginal cost. So that's a win. Our goal is to try to find some things that policymakers could use that would be cost effective to boost exercise. And we certainly did, but we're really bad at predicting what it would be ex ante. So that suggests mega studies do have a lot of value. Um, we see enduring change is harder to achieve, but in the aggregate it's happening. Uh, and I'm really excited about mega studies uh, and their future. And I am going to use like the next seven minutes before we do Q&A to tell you about the future of mega studies and, and a really important domain, um, which is vaccination. So I think we're all pretty worried about how vaccination is going wherever we are in the world. It's our ticket out of this mess. So um, we wanted to see when it was clear that there was going to be a way out through vaccines, our team geared up and said, let's do some messaging studies around flu season in the fall of 2020 testing messages that we think would port over nicely to vaccines 
other people were busy developing the science that would save us, but we thought we needed some science that would convince people to take the vaccines and we needed it on that time scale. So we ended up running two mega studies this past fall. One was with Penn Medicine and Geisinger and one was with Walmart. Uh, and the Penn Medicine Geisinger study involved participants who had a primary care appointment during the 2020-2021 flu season at one of these healthcare practices. And we had 20 different messages that we tested. The condition people were randomly assigned to would then determine what text messages they got in the three days leading up to an appointment, encouraging them to get a vaccine when they saw their doctor and were offered one. And we ended up with about 50,000 people in the study and uh, half of them roughly had taken a flu shot the prior year. And in our holdout control group, which just got usual care where, you know, they go to the doctor's office or offered a vaccine, they can say no, 42% of people accepted a vaccine. Okay, so these are, this is again, one of those graphs where reading everything on the y-axis will make you dizzy. So instead, I'm going to focus you on what I want you to pay attention to. I'm, I'm showing you these so you can see uh, the distributions of our effects, because I think that's really interesting. So the x-axis, again, is as a treatment effect estimate. So the percentage point increase in flu vaccination induced by different messages we tested. And these are 95% confidence intervals. So when the um, whiskers don't overlap with the usual care control, which is the blue line, that means a significant effect. And those are also red dots. So about a third of the treatments we tested significantly increased vaccination rates and the best performer increased them by about five percentage points at no added cost. Well, I guess it sounds, costs like a penny to send a couple of these messages in bulk. Um, all three of the best performers, interestingly, use the same language that ends up in a meta-analysis being like really critical, it seems, of saying a shot is reserved for you. Um, none of the other conditions use that language, but the three best performers all sent you messages with that language about your shot. So I'll just show you the top performer, which we're now strongly recommending be used whenever possible, this kind of wording. So, you know, first has a legalese, like you can get out of this if you want to. You have a vaccine or an appointment with your doctor coming up and a flu vaccine is available. Look out for a reminder. And then here's really the key one. It says this reminder um, is telling you it's been a vaccine has been reserved for you for your appointment. Please ask your doctor for the shot to be sure you receive it. Um, and, it and an analysis of the content, this um, really formal language ends up being dramatically more predictive of what works. We tried all sorts of things from, you know, we shared a joke. Uh, we told people do it for other, other folks. Um, we sent them videos. We said, you know, beat another region, all sorts of different ideas, but reserve for you again, really rose to the top and really clinical language, interactivity, sort of casual language, sharing the joke, those things didn't perform well at all when we did sort of an attribute analysis. It's really saying like a reminder and a formal email and highlighting it's reserved for you. Okay, so the Walmart study we did involved uh, people who had gotten a flu shot at Walmart pharmacy during the prior flu season and were signed up for text messages. And we tested different messages here. Again, we went to our team and we ran a tournament for ideas. The messages were different because we think different things might nudge you to drive over to your pharmacy and ask for a flu shot than to accept one when your doctor offers it to you at an already scheduled visit. And so different ideas came in, but it, we sent them all on September 25th, right at the beginning of flu season. And then some sent in a second message uh, within three days of that one. This is a much larger sample, 734,000 people. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know the race of a lot of people, which is a really important factor we'd love to have had because we know hesitancy is related to, to race. Um, but the good news is we do see that um, our best performing message is doing well. I am not showing you a control condition here because until, as of now, we still don't have good data on the control condition we, we um, included. There was a mix up, but we are expecting it any day now. So that's delightful. So we're just comparing all the messages to each other. And the, the baseline here is the worst performer. Um, the best performer increased vaccination again by about 10%. And in this case, because it's a lower baseline rate of vaccination, that's about uh, two percentage points. And it is it's shockingly similar. They didn't allow us to use reserve free language in any of these, but they let us try waiting for you. And the best performing message used that language that's waiting for you. We saw exactly the same kinds of things in our attribute analysis, saying it's waiting for you, conveying that it's you know a default for you. That rose to the top. 
more formal language was much better. Things like, you know, everybody else is doing it. Here's a joke. Um, do it for other people didn't perform as well. And so again, we're, we feel like this is basically a replication. And I should have said at both Penn Medicine and Geising are very different populations. The reserve for you messaging, the same message was the very top performer at both sites. So we feel like we have really robust evidence that we can uh, nudge vaccine adoption using these kinds of messages that reminders emphasizing a shot is reserved for you or waiting for you seem like the right ones to use maybe by creating an endowment effect and sort of in a sense that we expect you to get it. There's no, no, no thinking to be done and it belongs to you already. So maybe you overvalue it. And again, we, we found that it really didn't work when we were too casual or, or sent jokes or used messaging techniques that people wouldn't expect to get from a doctor's office or a pharmacy, even though we thought that might grab attention and be more engaging. Okay, so I am on the button, 10 minutes left for Q&A. Let me stop there and be delighted to take questions. And thank you for having me. This was fun. Great, Katie. That was amazing. Uh, you made my job very easy because there were not that many questions, but also... Uh, Erica did a great job. So let me let me um, give you a few. Um, so one is, so Sarah asked, is there any insight into who these messages worked for? Um, and were some people more likely to accept the vaccine? And that might also be relevant to the gym study. Like, who do you know who's like, you know, most likely to be affected by that? Yeah, we um, did, I will say rudimentary, you know, heterogeneity tests for the, like not use, our machine learning crew. One of the nice things about this, having this big team that's working on this is there's like people with different areas of expertise. We have some computer scientists who are experts in machine learning and they are starting to play with the data, but haven't yet. So everything I'm going to say to you is based on like our rudimentary, like let's do a median split. But when we do those kinds of obvious heterogeneity analyses, like are men different than women? Are people who got their vaccine last year different than people who didn't? Are people who are older different than people who are younger? Um, we actually saw almost no heterogeneity. Like there was no significant differences in the performance of these across those different groups. The one group, and of course this is like the group you wouldn't want it to, be, to see it for, is in the Penn Medicine Geisinger data, we saw um, that there was a significant difference when you do like a, you know, test all of the coefficients for one group versus another and see if they differ significantly for non-white and white patients. But what that amounted to is actually a levels effect, which is also not what you want to see. So it's slightly less potent with minority populations. But in terms of the, the ty types of messages that work the best, actually the insights are roughly the same. They just weren't quite as effective. Um, so that's disappointing for sure. But it's what the data said. Yeah. Uh, at, Wal at Walmart, we have not been able to do heterogeneity analyses yet. So I don't have that for you. And also we don't have race data for 90% of people at Walmart, which is a huge bummer. We were hoping to have that, um, but we'll yeah. see. And I actually, ooh, one, so I'm sorry, like this is not, uh, Eric is talking about the prediction and that actually gives me another note. I should say we have some prediction data for these studies too. Again, predictions were awful. And another thing that's interesting is when we ask people, um, you know, like, will this change your behavior and show them a message? And then we actually looked at what did change behavior. So it's different people, right? Because we can't literally survey the Walmart customers, but there's no correlation, which I think is really um, important because so often we are trying to like run surveys and say, oh, what message will be optimal to use? And I've seen a lot of groups offering advice on what we should be doing around vaccination based on that kind of survey data. And we just find that it's completely unpredictive. And instead we really need the behavioral data to see the for reserve for you popping out, which by the way, I did not predict at all. I, I had my money on the joke. I thought the joke was gonna be fabulous. We sent like a text message with a picture of a cat and a dog and it was really funny. I was sure that would capture attention and I was just totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, from a policy point of view, the heterogeneity analysis will become extremely important, right? So, you know, any data that you will have at some point will be super useful. Um, maybe on that note of the prediction study, I will just uh, interject with my own question. Uh, since we are running currently uh, a prediction study with BCFG and BIT, and so uh, you haven't seen the results yet, so I'm not going to spoil that fun for you. But one of the questions that I have in the context of your own study here, do you believe the predictions are so bad because they focus on average effects? Do you believe it would be different if they have to predict long run effects? Like, do you see like any reason for why people seem to not be able to predict effectiveness across the board, irrespective of, you know, uh, the background and yeah. I'm so intrigued by that question. And we really don't know. Um, Linnea Gandhi is a, a first year PhD student in OID. Um, and she is so fascinated by that, that I, 
she's going to be doing a lot of work investigating it in the years ahead. I think she's really, really interested in understanding what biases um, give rise to these kinds of prediction errors. But honestly, it's not at all clear. I mean, the, the over optimism makes some sense to me that we just, we look at something in isolation, right? And we're like, gosh, that seems potent. And it's really hard to imagine what it's like when you're not staring at a screen being paid to answer a survey about uh, but rather like out in the world, distracted, probably not even looking at your text message from Walmart pharmacy. <laughs> so like, so that overconfidence, that one makes more sense to me, but the misordering is much more worrisome, frankly, as, um, even by experts. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that sort of sophistication in terms of being a practitioner does not seem to matter too much compared to- Right. And, people, and right? it's certainly yeah. worth noting that like there are other studies where people have made better predictions like Devin Pope and Stefano Delavigna yeah. have some great stuff, but those largely look at incentives, which I, I think are maybe a bit better understood. Like you can say like, oh, look, I think $2 will work better than 20 cents. And it generally right. does. Um, whereas it's a little harder to, it, it's like less of an apples to apples comparison when you're thinking about like social norms versus belonging, right? So, or versus a commitment device, those things are a little less, it's a little less clear how to think about what will beat what. Great, yeah. Um, so Avner um, asked, let me just rephrase uh, the question that he asked was in a way, um, he told an anecdote of students going to the gym at his university, just checking in, chilling, having a coffee, leaving and then getting sort of a payment. Um, um, Erica already answered that you don't have any data on, on the workouts and whether they even worked out. My question would be, have you collected maybe any sort of soft data on self-reported weight or anything? Like it would be great to see not only whether the, these interventions increased attendance, but also whether it led to weight loss or anything health related. Like, do you have any um, data or do you plan maybe to collect some of that in the near future? That's a valid criticism for studies that pay people $175 to go to the gym. We pay people 20 cents and they have to drive their average distance to the gym from their home is like five miles. So I don't think it's a valid criticism for the order of magnitude studies that we ran. Um, so, so I'm not worried about that at all. And no, we can't get health metrics because these are, you know, 63,000 people in the wild. We can't put them on scales. It's not, it's not the kind of research where that like that's for the lab, not for the field when we're doing a mega study like this. I will say that um, I did a study with Google that I mentioned, John Bashirs and I ran where we saw durable changes in behavior uh, after a four week intervention where we paid slightly more, more like two dollars to seven dollars in that case. And there we were able to get some Fitbit data for a sample of participants and validate that basically we're seeing huge spikes in number of steps people are taking after they swipe into the gym. But there's also nothing else to do really at 24 hour fitness. There aren't like cafes, there aren't people to hang out with. Like it's really, it's a, it's a really basic gym. Um, and again, you have to drive and park. It, like it's just not a place where people are going to hang out with their friends and collect their 20 cents. Yeah. So let me ask you an unfair question uh, in a way that I want your prediction uh, about all these interventions. I mean, the um, some of the interventions you should have like a downward sloping trend. And of course you're limited in, in, you know, in the time window that you look at, uh, how confident are you that some of these would have a real long-term behavioral change, you know, type of, you know, what, what do you think? Do you believe these are more like one time off? Do you believe if you keep doing them, you will keep people up? Like, what is your gut feeling now having seen all of this data? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely an empirical question, but the fact that we see this sort of 30% durability, post even when the treatment ends that's really quite consistent across makes me think that there's some carryover effect and some ability like if we had kept it going it probably would have continued to work at least for some of them and I think you know one of the big regrets I have is that we just did four weeks and done when these were so incredibly inexpensive and uh, it would have been really nice if we had kept it going like I, my, my book coming out in May one of the things I write about is that my frustration with um, I'd say my old way of thinking about behavior change, like I had this fantasy that uh, we could like create habits over the course of a short period, like four weeks and then like let go and people would be changed durably. And I no longer have that illusion. And I think what we should really be working on for those of us who want to create durable change is durable interventions. Yeah, I'm waiting for that book to arrive, right? So that's, I'm excited. Um, and uh, so we are on time. I know that Katie has a heart stop or two. Um, so let's be mindful. Uh, of that Katie that was amazing, a mega study by mega, you know, amazing researchers. So that's uh, could not be more timely. 
Um, thank you so and, much for hosting yeah. and, and yes. asking great questions. This was super fun. And Erica, thank you for helping. <laughs> yes, Erica, great job. And also Sarah for, for the video in the beginning yes. and opening act. Uh, it's great. We can give you a stage and please come back in a few weeks when Zimon is going to present his work. So uh, thanks so much, everybody. Bye, everybody.